As a wife of an FBI agent, you became friends with one of his most trusted informants. This informant used to call you every day and share the details of her day-to-day -day life. But now that you think about it, you haven't heard from her in a while. And on top of that, your husband's behavior got really strange. He's lost a ton of weight and has been getting sick more and more often. Then you hear on the news that your friend, the FBI informant Susan Smith, has gone missing. This is the story of Mark Putnam, the FBI killer. I had to pause reading Hunger Games, mocking Jay, the last one, where there's not too much plot happening when it comes to the books. It's just anguish. It's just anguish. I had to stop my anguish and pass on the feels to reading the book that is called Above Suspicion. It, it has a longer name. I'll put it on the screen. It's by this guy called Joey Sharkey. It is a guy, right? Yeah, I think I googled his picture. And when I tell you, I devoured that book yesterday. I literally read the whole book. Like, 99.9% .9 of the story that I'm telling you today is from that book. So, it's a well-written book. Okay. The only thing that I have to say, Joey, if you're listening, I love you, but that book did not need 433 pages made. Mm -mm. I would recommend you read the book and let me know. Do you share my opinion? And do you share his? Because there are a couple of times when I don't necessarily agree with Joey when it comes to how he's portraying the inner thoughts of certain characters in this story. Which brings me to the story of the day. My is the name, people who have gone too far is the theme of this month. We spoke about a couple who wrote letters to serial killers, and this week we are flipping that on its head and we are speaking about the FBI agent who was the first federal agent to be accused and charged with murder. And because this is a long one, we are going to dive straight in. Mark Putnam was born on July the 4th, 1959. He studied criminology at the University of Tampa, and in 1986 he graduated from the FBI Academy. We meet Mark when he was only 27 years old, he just got out of the FBI Academy, and married his wife Kathy, who was the daughter of the wealthy real estate developer. The FBI Academy stationed him in Pikeville in Kentucky, so in 1987 he moved there, and he was really excited for this job post. He told his supervisor once he met him that he is going to bust his ass for him so that it reflects well on the manager as well as on Mark. And the supervisor kind of consolidated the outlook that Mark already had of this place in Kentucky, and he said, just do your caseload. You don't have to bust your ass. And then he followed by saying, nobody really wanted this position. Like, this is not the station that you want, that you volunteer for. And that's probably why they sent you as this fresh of the academy FBI agent. They just gave you whatever. But Mark was not discouraged. Mark immediately started working on the bank robbery cases in the area. And as he was starting his post in Kentucky, there was a robbery that has just happened. In this robbery, a person stole $18,000 in cash from a bank nearby in Meta in Kentucky. After the police had some false leads and they passed this on to the FBI, they start focusing on this guy called Carl Edward Lockhart, nicknamed Cat Eyes, who was the local repeat offender who had the habit of wildly spending his loot. And when the FBI took a look at this case, they realized that this guy actually has some great personality traits. Cat eyes, that is. He's really gregarious, really friendly, and just very talkative. They saw that, in particular, as the weakness that they can exploit. And this is when Mark mentions, well, I've heard that the FBI has this whole budget that they spend on informants. Like, the police does have it as well, but we really seem to be swimming in it. Usually how this worked is that the FBI would have this pool of informants that they would be using on certain cases, obviously not on all of them, because then everybody knows that you are technically a snitch. So these informants would volunteer certain information for some compensation. Usually it would be between 500 to to $1,000 
per substantial lead that would lead to somebody's arrest. And then depending on your involvement, depending on the lead that you have given them, they might pay you some more if the case goes to trial and you have to testify at trial because then obviously your identity is compromised and is revealed. But the main thing about the initial payment is that sometimes these FBI agents would take the cut. So they come to you as an informant with like $500 and be like, I'm so sorry, I couldn't get any more while they actually took a cut of $200 or $500 themselves. But Mark decided he is not going to be one of those people. He wanted to be really generous when these informants do give him valid information. Looking at the case of Cat Eyes and the people he would associate himself with, one name really stuck with Mark and his supervisor, and that was the name of Kenneth Smith. Kenneth was actually Cat Eyes' friend from childhood, and one thing about Cat Eyes was that when he had money, his friends also had money. Meaning that he wouldn't just be sharing booze, coke, and cash, but would also provide things like clothing, accessories for his associates and for their families. So when Mark's supervisor Bird suggested Kenneth as a potential informant, Mark looked into it, and he kind of saw Kenneth as a liability. Because the way Mark saw it, Kenneth was too involved. He was his friend since childhood, and yes, that was a great thing, because it meant that Cat Eyes would be sharing anything with him. But also on the other end, you know how you have like conversations with certain friends? If they were suddenly to turn, and then the new conversations were all around the topic of just bank robberies, well then this bank robber is going to start being really suspicious of that. Maybe start checking if Kenneth is wearing a wire, getting suspicious isn't really a plan. It won't yield any results. We need one shot and one shot only to bust this guy's ass. So his supervisor, Bert, is there sitting just like, okay, I think I understand what you mean, Mark. There is actually somebody in both Kenneth's and Kat's life that also used to provide me with some information in the past, and that is Kenneth's wife, Susan. And when Mark met Susan, he thought that she had an edge, and she had an attitude, she wasn't about to be a pushover. He also didn't think that she was particularly attractive. She was put together. This book said that she would put makeup on even the days when she wouldn't leave the house. She took care of herself, but what was most important for the mission was that she was chatty. She was a blabbermouth. She would get this guy to talk. But what got Susan to accept this post as his informant was, of course, the money. Because suddenly she realized, wait, Bert didn't used to pay me the amount of money Mark is promising me. He's promising me, like, 500 to 1,000 per every piece of information. Like, he doesn't even seem to want to get a cut himself. So, of course, she takes the bait and she starts meeting Mark twice or three times every week. Now, let's talk a bit about Susan and the state of mind that she was in at this point in time. Susan was born in 1961 in West Virginia to Sidney Daniels, an unemployed former coal miner, and Tracy Daniels, a housekeeper. Being the fifth of the nine children in the family, the family was poor. They were on welfare most of her life, and she was also very ashamed of that fact. Her upbringing wasn't great due to poverty, due to her dad drinking, and the mom having to bear with it to bring these kids on her own, and just remaining in the background being neglected by her husband. So, after seventh grade, Susan decides to drop out of school, and this was also the time when she met Kenneth Smith. Kenneth Smith had a couple of problematic things going for him at the time. One was that he was a drug dealer and a user, and the second one was that he was 22, while Susan was 15. A couple of red flags must be going in everybody's heads right now, and yes, this relationship was as exploitative in nature as you would think it was. Susan saw the opportunity to leave her family, to leave the hard work and the poverty behind, and Kenneth saw her as an asset. 
Kenneth considered himself a good gambler, so he would go to bigger cities that had bigger casinos in them, and he would bring Susan on. Susan was good with numbers, she had good memory, and she had this engaging personality that was useful to Kenneth to close his deals. And Susan truly, by the age of 17, it just seems as if she has lived a thousand lives already. She called herself his executive assistant because she was helping these drug transactions go through. And when she was 17, Kenneth actually got arrested for drug possession, so he had to serve some time in prison, which meant that Susan had to move in with his family, Louisiana. And there she found a job at this fast food restaurant, but she wasn't earning enough, so she turned to sex work. Kenneth eventually gets released, and he decides this time it's time to turn a new page, it's time to get a decent job. He goes back to Susan, gets a job as the carpenter's assistant. But Susan always wanted more. She wanted a lavish lifestyle that was sort of promised to her at the age of 15 when she went on to marry Kenneth. Now suddenly he's on this straight pathway, not making enough money for the family. And also she got pregnant. She had her first daughter then. Now there was an extra mouth to feed, things just weren't improving, and on top of that, Kenneth would be taking out his rage on Susan, and he started beating her up, and then in the typical domestic abuser fashion, he would apologize in the morning and say that everything is going to be better, that he is not going to repeat that any longer, and then the cycle would continue. This relationship with Kenneth now is on and off. There is an outburst of domestic violence, Susan goes with Miranda to her parents, but then finally she returns to Kenneth every single time, to the point that in 1985 they actually had a son, they had a second child. But soon after that, the two of them would end up divorcing, but Kenneth would never properly move out. It would be on and off, like he would go to his family or she would go to hers, but they still live together. And this is the point in 1987 when Susan meets Mark. She's living under the same roof in an unhappy marriage with Kenneth, who now has nothing really to offer. Everything that he promised her when she was 15, he just failed to achieve. And here comes a man with a great career, with no criminal record, with something to offer her in form of compensation, but also somebody that really needed Susan, and that was truly what she was craving. As she desperately wanted to feel needed, wanted to feel loved, it is not really hard to understand how she would misconstrue any communication with Mark, and she would respond as a woman who was desperately in love. From the get-go, the communication between Mark and Susan was strained. And that was mostly because of Susan's approach to everything. So she would have to meet with Mark a couple of times a week so that they speak about the case, so that she gives any information that she can in person. And on one such occasion, after Susan actually came through with a valid lead about cat eyes, Mark obviously paid her up and he gave her about $1,500. And she kind of took some of that money and handed it back to him. And he was like, is this a setup? Why are you giving me back the money? And she said, no, you deserve to have the cut of this money because, well, you were ill on this, like you were guiding me, you were advising me. But Mark found this so weird. He constantly thought, like, what if she's trying to, like, set me up for something? So he consulted one of his supervisors, and this guy told him, like, don't worry, just take the money and then just put it towards her next payment. Like, she will never know, and technically you are then not doing anything wrong. Then, as the case on cat eyes would progress, Susan would obviously, as I mentioned, have to, as an informant, testify in trial. And that would, in return, bring her a substantial amount of money. So she negotiated with Mark, and she said, well, I want to testify on your behalf, of course. I want to testify as the FBI informant, but then I'm putting the life of myself and my children in danger. So Mark was like, okay, cool, name your price. And she said $4,000. And Mark, instead of being like, okay, no, this is alarming, this is unbelievable, Susan, we have never paid an informant that much, Mark would just accept anything that she would propose. 
And that is at least from the perspective of Joey Sharkey, who interviewed Mark, because Mark never really saw this as anything else. He was like, cool, you're the informant, I meet with you, this is my job, I pay you as much money as you want, I understand, like, you want to protect your children, cool, I'll consult my supervisors, I'll pay up some more if needed. But on the other end, Susan saw this as more of a relationship, or at least more of a relationship that she had with Kenneth. It was giving her job, it was giving her something to do, it was providing her with an income, and she also corresponded with a guy who was intelligent, who was handsome, was only a few years older than her, and had his shit together. In that way, I want to say that Susan breached certain boundaries, but boundaries from everything that I read were never there in the first place, meaning that she always saw this as more of a personal relationship rather than professional. She immediately, as she started corresponding with Mark, she would call up his house. She developed a weird friendship with his wife, Kathy. So she would start these calls being like, Hey, Kathy, it's Susan. And then, is Mark there? Sometimes she wouldn't even ask about Mark. She would start chatting with Kathy about how her life has been. Then she would go on and talk to Kathy about how her days have been, how her children are doing, how Kenneth is drinking again or gambling again. But then, as the calls would progress, she would kind of ask more and more questions about Mark. Like, hey, what are you eating for dinner? You know, sometimes it would be subtle, like, what are you preparing? What is his favorite food? Oh, where is he now? Does he have any hobbies that he does after work? Oh, he runs. Okay, cool. And then she knows that down in her freaking mental bank, and then goes on to buy Mark certain gifts. So, there was this occasion where she literally turned up in the freaking FBI office where Mark is with these, like, Nike shoes and, like, the whole gear for running. And Mark is just there, like, I can't accept this, Susan. Like, we are not in a... Rela- like, why are you buying me gifts? You're the informant. I pay you. This is not how it works. And she will get proper pissed off because she's like, I care about you the way you care about me. You see what I mean? The boundaries were never there in the first place. Susan's conversations with Kathy are what, in my head, makes this case so much more interesting. At first, it started off as just building rapport. Like, Susan would call, be like, hey, Kathy, Susan here, remember me, I work with your husband, I'm the informant, I was supposed to meet with him today, like, did he make it home, are we postponing this for another day, can he come to the phone, or can you just, like, relay that information to me? She would describe herself and her position as somewhat of an executive secretary. As we know from Susan's earlier life, she wanted this identification as one of the boys. It was important to her to have a title. And that's where the conversations kind of progressed. Susan saw Kathy and Mark as these people who are more educated than her, more well-spoken than her. So, when she would speak with Kathy, she would kind of pick up on, like, speech patterns and suddenly would try to use them herself. There was this time when Kathy told her she went to the hairdresser and got, like, a really short haircut that Susan made her describe that haircut, and then the next day she got and cut her hair short to sort of resemble Kathy. But because of how openly Susan would speak about grooming, about etiquette, about her life, her problems, all in an attempt, yes, to build rapport and to get more information on what Mark was doing, well, she got to learn a lot about Kathy herself. When one evening Susan confided in Kathy about her upbringing, about how she actually had to resort to prostitution when Kenneth was in prison to survive, of her life with Kenneth under him as, like, a domestic abuser, of how she's trying to move on with her life now, even though he's technically living in, like, a live-in boyfriend, but they're not together. Kathy opened up to her as well, and she told her she wasn't this blushing maiden. She actually had a similar kind of background. She was bartending and waitressing, Kathy was, when she wasn't making enough money. So, she kind of spoke with somebody 
in the bar and they suggested that Katie is nice, she's good looking, she's hot, she should consider working in this massage parlor. And it is bizarre how similar these two stories actually were, but Katie was kind of in an on and off relationship with her ex-boyfriend as well when she started working in this massage parlor. And this was when, at the bar where she was waitressing, this guy approached her and started flirting with her, and she rejected him, and this ex-boyfriend intervened, started a fight with this guy, and he was jailed for the fight, but the guy hasn't been jailed. And the guy actually followed Katty that evening and broke into her apartment and raped her. Katie tried to make Susan understand that there were perils to their life and showing her that it was never too late for her. So he told her that she actually ended up marrying this guy, the ex-boyfriend, and this marriage only lasted for about four months. And then one night, in a drunken rage, as he was drunk driving, he sort of smacked her around in the car and just pushed her out of it and she never saw him again. And Katie, in an attempt to share with Susan how she turned her life around and things can definitely turn around for Susan herself, sort of shared a story about how she ended up meeting Mark. So at the age of 21, Katie, now out of that toxic relationship, was just living in this flat. It was nothing special. But she was managing apartments, she was making a living, and she wasn't running home to depend on her family. And one night, as she is just chilling in her apartment after work, her neighbor kind of knocks on her door, and this was like a middle-aged man that lived next door, and he just says, hey, would you like to make me some company? Like, I'm gonna go have a dinner at this bar where this woman I really, really like is singing. And Kat is at her flat, she's like, I don't have any plans, like, I might as well. And during this dinner, this neighbor of hers got insanely drunk, to the point that people, like, sitting at the tables nearby sort of started glancing at them and then kind of helping her out, like, take care of him, get him outside, get some fresh air, take him back in. And one of those people was this middle-aged widow that was sitting right next to it, and she started speaking with Kathy, saying, like, I have a son that is just right about your age, maybe, like, a few years older. He just finished studying at the FBI Academy. He's going to become an FBI agent. Let me put you two in touch. And Kathy's there, like, I'm just taking care of this drunk person. Like, I'm not trying to get into... Like, this is weird. Why is this guy's mom offering him up? Like, how desperate must this guy be? That he's like, oh, supposedly an FBI agent and his mom is trying to set him up. Yeah, right. So this mom goes to the phone, I don't know if it was a payphone, if it was the phone in the restaurant, and actually rings her son and just passes the phone on to Katie. And Katie is kind of, like, apologetic. She's apologizing to Mark, like, oh my god, like, I'm so sorry, like, your mom just put me on the spot. I don't even know why I'm talking to you right now. But they kick it off immediately. They started sort of running jokes, bouncing jokes off one another, And Mark asked her, like, why don't we meet tonight? I mean, you clearly need to leave that drunken person behind, so just meet me tonight. And that is how they bet. They stayed up the whole night talking about their future. Mark was telling her how he wants to be this FBI agent. And Katie was telling him how she only wants a nice, stable marriage. She is just looking for security, for peace, and for happiness. And the two of them just clicked. After this, the two of them started living together. They were living together for about two years, saving up the money for the marriage and for the children that they planned to have. And Katie knew she just had to fess up about, like, the whole ex-boyfriend situation, about her rape, and about her working in this massage parlor. It was never insinuated in this book that she ever, like, slept with any of the clients in that massage parlor, but she was still kind of getting money, like, 
massaging them or just rubbing herself on top of them. She always tried to just get most money without doing the most in these massage parlors, but she still wanted a clean slate. Like, she didn't want any secrets in this marriage with Mark. So she sat him down one night and just told him about her past. And apparently he just stood up and left. And she was like, well, that's great. I'm never gonna see this guy again. And apparently a couple of days later, he just returned and he said, let's just leave that in the past and never mention that again. And she agreed. Now that there is this rapport built between Hattie and Susan, I think both of them are viewing this relationship differently. Susan is doing what qualifies her as a great informant. She has great listening skills and she knows how to make people talk and she's implementing those skills with Kathy. She's getting the information that she wants on the person that she wants to know that information about, which is Bark. And she's doing it for a reason. She wants to behave, to act, to look like his wife in order to establish whether it is an affair, whether that can lead to a relationship, and for Mark to be what he was for Kathy, like the safe haven, the prospect of a greater future. While Kathy is looking at this relationship as just her helping Susan out, helping this poor girl who just ended up working with her husband, giving her advice on how to move on, how to make her life better. And yes, Kathy wasn't crazy. Like, she saw that Susan asked more and more questions about Mark, that she sort of, like, started copying her in different ways. But she, from everything I gathered, didn't see that that would escalate. She never saw it as anything alarming. She was like, okay, maybe this is the way that in her psyche she is turning to a better life. Like, yes, she seems to identify with me, to copy certain moves that I made, but that is all in an attempt to find her own Mark, to find her own safe haven. And that is because Kathy trusted Mark. Like, Mark would come home and he, first of all, wouldn't really enjoy the fact that Susan and Kathy were, like, the best of friends, but he also didn't mind it. Like, there was nothing to arouse Eddie's suspicions. And on top of that, he would kind of always say, like, Kathy, like, you don't know her. She's a big mouth. She's going around the freaking FBI office saying that she's sleeping with people from the courthouse. One of these days, she's just gonna end up pregnant and claim that it's one of their kids. You can drop the advice. She clearly isn't really following it. So just don't mind her. Don't, like, pay too much attention to what she's saying because a lot of it is lies and a lot of it is just trying to get other people to talk. At the end of that October, Mark and Kathy are expecting their second child. So they had a daughter, Danielle, and they're expecting a son. And the plan was for Kathy to go to her parents' house for a couple of weeks, all the way up until Christmas, and up until the birth of the child. It was about to happen at the same time. And then for Christmas holidays, Mark is going to travel and join the two of them. While Kathy is away, Mark meets Susan as usual. Like, they're about to talk. Actually, Cat Eyes' trial is approaching, so he's now talking to her about actually testifying, prepping her and whatnot. But on this occasion, he's driving her, whether it is, like, back and forth from the station. So the two of them are in a car. And Susan starts talking about how she started running, just like Mark, how she actually lost 10 pounds. And, well, according to Mark's interview with the author, he didn't really seem to care, but he was just like, yay, that's great, Susan. And then Susan comes around and says, just in case you're interested. And he's like, interested in what? And she responds, just like, a fling. And Mark just brushes it off. He's like, a fling, Susan. Like, I am expecting a second child. Like, you want me to start a fling with you? Like, <laughs> you're, you're a bit crazy, Susan, right? You're also, like, best friends with my wife, and, like, you want to start an affair with me. And she's like, you like me, right? Why would she have to know? And Mark just kind of brushes it off, as if, like, <laughs> what a crazy proposition. And nobody sees this as, like, nothing alarming. Like, <laughs> yeah, I expected that from Susan, and he just drives her home and just moves on, like, nothing happened. 
The trial takes place in December 1987, and Kentai actually gets sentenced to 57 years in federal prison on the charges of robbery, mostly actually thanks to Susan. Mark owned up to his promise, and she didn't even get 4K. She got 5,000 for testifying in court, and it was brilliant because Kat actually didn't even believe that it would be Susan. He didn't believe that she would have the guts that this would actually be her. He said Kenneth must have put her to it. And with the closure of that trial, what happens now is Mark finally sees the opportunity to sort of get rid of Susan, because, well, she just proposed a freaking fling. She's clearly seeing this for something that it isn't. Like, he's just treating this as the relationship between an informant and an FBI agent, and she has done everything but that. So he gets this new guy that got into the FBI Academy to partner up with her. And this guy, Poole, was uh, way too happy about it because Poole actually really liked Susan. And Susan was smart. She saw what Mark was doing, but she was also desperate because, yes, now she got some amount of money, but still, it isn't enough for her to move out, to never see Kenneth again, and to just move into a flat with the two children. And also, after this trial, her options dried up, because people would kind of now know that it was Susan Smith that put cat eyes in prison, meaning that other drug affiliations might not really want to associate themselves with Susan, because, hey, Susan here appears to be a freaking snitch. So her options really dried up, and she was desperate, so she accepted to be Poole's FBI informant, which meant that the conversations with Katty and Mark also became less and less frequent. This was truly the point of no return in this story, because Susan started escalating, or rather de-escalating. The calls that she would make to Kathy now would just be in such a despair. On one such call, she actually said to Kathy that she signed off for her kids to be in the custody of Kenneth, only how desperate she was, how she hates working with Poole, how he's constantly just, like, hitting on her and trying to get with her, and how she just finds that disgusting. She's complaining about her life to Kathy, but also to anybody that would listen, but in particular now she's complaining to her sister Shelby. So remember how Mark would say earlier on to Kathy that uh, Susan would go around and say how she's sleeping with people from the courthouse? Well, now she has changed her tune, and Susan is confiding in her sister Shelby that Mark and her have actually been having an affair for quite a while, and that she already got pregnant with Mark's child, but then she had a miscarriage. So as for her personal life, she's just going, selling a different story to all these different people, but is very much frantic. There is this manic energy to her, and clearly she's just a bomb that's waiting to explode. And as for her professional life, well, she hates working with Paul. She's desperate to get Mark to work with her. And to top all of that off, she feels neglected by Mark, because Mark, at this point, I won't go into too much detail on this, but he actually used Kathy for one of the drug busts. He used Kathy because, well, nobody knew her, nobody knew of her, of her face in these circles of criminals, so he used Kathy to actually bust this coke dealer. And the word got to Susan. So Susan, in the state of desperation, actually just rang Mark one day, and she said, listen, I have an important lead, but I don't want to talk to Paul. I don't want to talk to anybody else. I want to give this lead to you. I want you to have it. I want you to take charge of this. I want you to take the reward. I don't want Paul to take care of this case. So Mark is kind of, like, intrigued, and he also just wants her off her back, so he's like, okay, cool, let's meet up again in the car, in this isolated spot where we would meet before when we worked on the Cat Eyes case. And yet again, during this car ride, Susan did what she did the best. She just let Mark vent, 
She just let him tell her all about his professional, personal struggles. She built rapport, and she found a connection between the two of them. And she decided this is the time she finally took her shot. So she starts that off by telling him that he looks terrible as of lately, which, like, girl, your pickup game is just not the strongest, is it? Then she moves in, she kisses him, and tells him, I think you should make love to me right now, Mark. And according to Mark, he said, I don't think this is a good idea, Susan. But she said, it's too late for that. Just relax. And that is when they made love for the first time. And of course, it wouldn't be the only time. Because a few days later, after ignoring Susan again, after just thinking, like, she will disappear. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. For somebody who is a freaking FBI agent, like, you can't read people for shit, Mark. So, a couple of days later, they ended up in the same car, in the middle of nowhere, again. Mark would later go to say that these making love events only happened five times across two weeks. So, that this was not an affair that Susan was talking to everybody about. It just happened a couple of times. Let's underplay it. Yeah, it only happened a few times in that car in the middle of nowhere. And then he he was done. He got it out of his system. He felt really bad about it. And he was over it. But he didn't really communicate that with Susan. And Susan doesn't like to be ignored, Mark. I hate to break it to you. This woman really doesn't like to be ignored. This change in relationship between Susan and Mark, of course, brought a change in relationship between Susan and Kathy. Because now she wasn't calling as often, but when she did, she would be thrilled. Suddenly, a complete change in demeanor. She seemed to be taunting Kathy in a way. Like, she would be talking, talking, and then say, gotta go, Kathy, dear. Guess who just pulled up out front? And then she would hang up. And Kathy would kind of sit on it and be like, she's getting into my head. Like, it's not Mark. Mark is at work. And then she would call the FBI office, and sure enough, it would be Mark answering. And she's just like, this woman is playing with my head. Like, what is going on? Why is she suddenly completely happy? Because Mark is acting completely normal. Then there was also this occasion when Susan on the phone confided in Kathy again about her miscarriage. And as she was talking to her, Kenneth kind of took the phone and said to Kathy, yeah, it was Mark's baby. And then they would just hang up. And Kathy would face Mark each and every time. And she would say, Mark, Kenneth said it was your baby. And Mark would just brush it off, like, what, you believe Kenneth now? Like, what's next? Susan and Kenneth are both clearly insane. Why would you believe any of them? One quick sideline here. The biggest point of contention for me in this book was the fact that I really disagree with Joey Sharkey, the author, on certain points. I know he's trying to portray this through the interviews that he had with Mark, and obviously this is the information that came out to the man. But it always leads you to believe, like, oh yeah, Mark really hated the fact that, you know, the Susan was all over him. Mark only had this two-week affair, you know, they only did it this amount of time. Like, in every single instance, it just seems like Mark really just hated that Susan was there, which, yes, could be true, but for me, the gaslighting is what makes it a lot less true. Like, there is no need for Mark to be like, Susan is crazy every single fucking time he gets a chance. Because for me, that kind of makes me feel like maybe Susan wasn't lying in all of the occasions. Because we later talk about how this escalates and just the gaslighting in this story every time when Susan's name appears makes me feel like, you know, Mark wasn't maybe 100% honest in every single situation that involved Susan. And here the reason behind Kathy not taking this situation as seriously, or maybe not seeing the switch in Susan as obvious as you and me do, is because she was getting other kind of phone calls, the threatening ones. Because you remember she was involved in a case, and also whether it was because of that or because of Mark working for the FBI and them knowing that they used FBI informants, they just placed this huge drug dealer in jail, well, people started threatening them. 
Kathy would pick up a call and she would hear a voice say, We ain't sure whose side you are no more. We think you've been sleeping with cops too long. You are alone with the babies tonight, aren't you? And then the calls would just hang up. And then that would repeat itself. So after some time, Mark, of course, went to his supervisors. And he was like, listen, we are getting threats. Like, I think I need to change the station. Like, I think I need to change the location where I'm working from in order to protect my family. And his supervisor agreed. And he found him a position in Miami, in Florida. This transfer came within days, and in April 1989, the two of them moved. Like, they gave them only a couple of days' notice. With Mark's move, Susan's behavior became even more erratic. She would just be chilling in her sister Shelby's flat, she would be watching Miami Vice, just constantly waiting for the phone to ring. But the phone would just never ring, or when it would, it would be Poole just getting her to have, like, some small job that wouldn't really bring her any money. One day, Susan actually ran into Cat Eyes' ex-girlfriend, Sherry, and Sherry started beating her up, and she threatened that she will kill her. Now, at this point, I think psychologically, Susan is desperate. She isn't even thinking clearly as to, like, this is a clear threat to my life. She kind of completely disregarded this because her whole focus was on Mark and how to get him to pay attention to her again. So she spread the rumor everywhere that actually Mark and her, for two years, they have been having this affair. She has had a miscarriage before, but now she's definitely pregnant with his child. And she would also give this kind of information to her partner, Poole, and she would tell Poole, well, you kind of need to tell me when he's coming back. I need to confront him. I need to make sure that he actually just doesn't skedaddle, like, run out of this child. Like, he needs to pay for child support. He needs to divorce Katty. All of that. And she would also be calling Kathy, leaving voice notes and telling her that she is pregnant. She wasn't telling her it was Mark's child, of course, but, like, it was just enough to go on Mark's nerves and for him to have to say that Susan is crazy again. What even if she is pregnant? Like, I don't know whose child that is. Why is she telling you that? Her sister Shelby believed Susan more than she believed Mark, whether it was on pregnancy or, like, any other details of this relationship, so she advised her to confront him. So, Susan said, yeah, of course, I will. But then, it came to her attention that Mark actually visited the FBI office in Pikeville and that he didn't tell her that he was there. So, next time she told Poole, you need to tell me. Because, listen, I'm going into this doctor's office to get the report, to get, like, the confirmation, to get the scan, to be able to prove him that I'm actually pregnant with this child. So, this doctor issued her report confirming that the child was conceived sort of end of February, and that she also had a miscarriage in January. So, like, beginning of January. So, for all of us doing math, that really doesn't match Mark's account of events, that this only happened five times over two weeks. But also, further in the story, this pregnancy will never get fully confirmed, which is the most frustrating part of this story, because this becomes so relevant. So, I'm not sure if these reports were actually issued, were they issued correctly, were they fabricated, And was Susan actually ever pregnant? And did she actually ever have a miscarriage? The only thing we know is that she did get these documents from this doctor confirming both the miscarriage and the pregnancy at the due date in order for her to start claiming welfare benefits. Well, she said that was the reason, but she was already on the benefits. So, this was purely to prove it to Mark. The second time that Mark returns to Pikeville, he actually meets up with Susan. And Susan, again, confronts him. She says, it is your child. We never use protection. And I am not aborting this time. I'm having this child. Now, I think we can all be pretty sure where Susan for this conversation will lead. But what comes out of Mark's mouth pissed even me off. And I'm not even here sitting in a car with Mark pregnant, okay? Like, and I'm just like, Mark, wrong line for an FBI agent. Read the room, Mark. Because Mark says, if this is my baby, I don't want you to bring it up. Kathy and I would raise it. 
of course, this insinuates that she must be a shitty mother because he wants to take a child for Kathy, who also is unaware of this whole situation, to what, raise somebody else's child? So, Mark, a couple of things that just weren't taken into consideration when uttering this line. So, of course, Susan gets fuming. She starts telling Mark how she plans to ruin his life. She wants him to leave Kathy, to start living with her, and to raise this child as his own. And if he doesn't, she owns him. She is going to get his bosses to fire him, because, hey, she works at a place, she can have the power to get him fired. And Mark, again, according to him, starts protecting Kathy. He is saying that Kathy doesn't have anything to do with this. She was actually her friend. Like, how do you not see this situation? Like, how could you do this to Kathy? Which, yet again, not the best course of this conversation. So, Susan is just escalating, getting more and more angry, to the point that she tells him that he is no man that she has had real men before, and that he is nothing, that he can't fuck worth a damn, and she told everybody that, that he is nothing but a spoiled rich kid. And apparently this last comment about him being the rich spoiled kid was the one that took him over the edge, because he remembered his father, and how his dad was taking these odd jobs for the family to survive, and to put him through school. And this is when he slaps Susan. And it's just such a heated argument that she obviously starts swearing at him. And he said at that moment he just wanted some peace and quiet. He just wanted to think. Like, he was not thinking rationally. He was not making rational decisions. This conversation is clearly not the best conversation he has ever had. So, he just put his hands around her throat and just started saying, like, relax, Susan, relax. But then, after some time, he just seems to have snapped out of it. He didn't even realize how many minutes have passed. And he takes the hands off her throat and he's like, Susan, Susan, like, starts shaking her. And then the realization hits him. Susan Smith was dead in his car. As he's freaking out, he obviously has, like, meetings to attend. He has work to do in this Pikeville office. So, he just puts her body in the trunk and then just moves on with his day. And later, at around, like, 4 p.m., he kind of gets out of the courthouse and he's just lurking around his car, sort of just sniffing for the smells of the decomposing body because at this point he doesn't know what to do any longer. He knows the next day he needs to go back to Miami. So, whatever he does needs to be today and somewhere where she might not be discovered. So, that day he finds this ravine next to the coal mining road and he just takes one last look at Susan and the book insinuates that both in the car just before her murder and also when disposing of her body, that Mark was always kind of paying attention whether or not she was actually pregnant, and, like, how somebody who was five months pregnant would look like, whether he actually buys into this or not. And just after questioning that, he kind of pushes her body down the ravine, and then just leaves in that same car and goes home to his wife and kids to Miami. Three days after leaving her body in this ravine, Mark actually makes a call to Shelby, to Susan's sister. And he asks her, has she seen Susan? Like, the two of them should have met this second time that he visited Pikeville, but she never showed up, so he is just a bit worried. And he actually advises her, if she doesn't see her, to file the missing persons report. And that day, Shelby does just that. She follows a missing persons report. And, of course, this is now a local case, but the FBI is in on it, because she's technically one of them. She's one of their informants. This detective called Ray was put on the case. And this wasn't this guy's first case, right? So, he is looking into the last people that were in touch with Susan, and also Shelby immediately volunteered the information that she did not like Mark, there was something dodgy going on here, and, well, he was a married man, and my sister Susan told me that she was pregnant with him about five months along. 
so can you look into Mark first, please? Ray rings up Mark, and Mark is forthcoming. He is offering all the information, he is telling about Susan's informant days, and how well she might be in beef with a lot of people, including Sherry, Cat Eyes' girlfriend. He mentions Kenneth, how Kenneth was abusive, how he fit into that picture. Basically, how there are a lot of people that want Susan dead. Yes, he knew she was pregnant. He had no idea who the father was, though. He has heard the rumors that he is the dad, but of course, that's just Susan being Susan. In fact, when he tried to sort of like reach for her stomach the last time that he has seen her, well, she kind of just backed out. So, so he really tried to drill into Ray that he didn't really even believe that she was pregnant in the first place. He said the last time when he spoke to Susan was around 10.30 on the Wednesday evening when she called his room in the motel where he was staying while he was in Pikeville. And during this call, she told him about a strange phone call that she received about a meeting that she had with the drug contacts. And she called these drug contacts some guys from Chicago, the Amigos. Apparently, during this phone call, Mark even offered to follow her when she is to meet with these amigos from Chicago, these Spanish cops, and he is gonna follow her just in case of any trouble. And as he's trying to really do the most and just be helpful, Mark volunteers not only information about Wednesday night, about the Thursday night when apparently nobody heard from Susan after the Wednesday night, but also she gives the movie that he has seen on a Friday night. And Ray is just there like, why are you telling me all this information? Like, he gave just a bit too many details for somebody that doesn't have anything to do with this case. This is how they get you. This is how they would get me. Okay, they wouldn't because I would get the attorney. But even then, silence. Silence is how you get the millennials. If you just, like, let us chill in silence for, like, five seconds without any background noise, I'm there, I'm talking. I'm, like, at five years old, I threw a shoe at my mom. I don't know why I have anger management issues. Like, fuck it. And the irony of all of this was that Mark was now thinking about Susan every day, all day. It was in the back of his head. He was having nightmares. He could barely sleep at night. He started having, like, problems with digestion. He was losing a lot of weight. He was just constantly just sweaty, having diarrhea, getting sick. And I'm saying this is the irony of this whole story, because Susan would have loved for Mark to have been thinking about her every single minute of every single day when she was alive. But this happened because Mark was guilt-ridden. The police and the FBI here couldn't really have just the tunnel vision. Yes, they thought that Mark was guilty from that first conversation they had with her, possibly even from how Shelby described him. But there was another really good potential suspect, and that was Kenneth. He was abusive towards Susan, they constantly had this on-and-off relationship, he had a custody of the kids, and they wanted him in for the polygraph. But actually, Kenneth landed in prison because of some motor vehicle offenses. He ended up in prison for 30 days. Well, he was on house arrest because of that, so that he can take care of the kids. So, they had to wait for at least over a month to speak with Kenneth. And once they did, well, they didn't learn anything new. They looked at this guy and they were like, there is really no motive here. Like, there is nothing that would have driven this guy to kill her. He had the custody of the children already. Like, what else would it have been? Jealousy? They are already divorced for about six years at this point, when Susan died. There just isn't really, like, any motivation for him to have snapped now, even if he learned that she was pregnant with Mark's child. After clearing Kenneth's name, the police in Kentucky rings the FBI office in Miami, and they tell him, like, just tell Mark that we're gonna come down to Miami to finally question him. It's gonna be like a recorded interrogation. And they do. And at this point, it would almost be about a year after Susan was killed. 
they didn't have her body and Mark was already in the state of distress, like his physical appearance was altered, he has lost a ton of weight and he just looked like the shadow of his old self. And he would constantly get information from Pikeville because of him liaising with that FBI office. So he would kind of know where the case was going and who they're interviewing. And, you know, every single update would kind of give him a pen. Like, he would look at his children and he would be like, what am I going to do? Like, what do I do? I either confess and go to jail and probably never see these children again, or I don't confess and this thing eats me out alive. So when he went to speak with Ray, he kind of started off slowly. I don't think that he was sure where he was going with this either. So he started off literally from day one, then his education, he spoke about the time in the FBI Academy, and they're just like, they're like, okay, why do we need details on all of this? But they're sitting there thinking, okay, it might lead to something. Then he speaks about how he met Susan, how she became the informant, the whole cat eyes case. And they're there like, it's, it's been hours, Mark. Like, any progression on this? Anything you have to share about the actual night? But instead, he concluded this interrogation by saying, I have no idea where Susan Smith is at the present time. Both Ron Poole and I cared about her very much and are concerned as to what happened to her. I certainly did not kill her intentionally or accidentally, because I could never do anything like that. But despite of him saying this, Ray and all of the other detectives just looked at his demeanor, just looked at how disheveled he was, and how he just like put his head into his hand, and he was just sweating profusely. And they just knew that he was guilty, but they had no body. They had nothing tying this man to this murder. So on this occasion, they have to let him go. And Ray, this detective, was thinking like, this is eating him up. Eventually, he will come around. Let him go speak to Kathy. So he does on that evening, but he does it in such a way, just saying, like, yeah, they're just interrogating me about Susan. And Kathy's like, oh my god, this is unbelievable. Kathy is fuming that whole evening. She's like, I'm gonna go speak with them. Mark is like, there's no, there's no need to. But the next day, she goes and she's actually fuming. She's asking people, like, why are you interrogating him? Why are you investigating him? You seem to have never had his back. And Ray tries to calm Kathy down. He's like, listen, we have his back. This is just how investigations go. Tomorrow he's going to come. We're going to conduct a polygraph test. And we're going to see if anything spikes up, if anything doesn't match up his story. Like, we're going to see if it all checks out. Nothing to worry about, Kathy. It's just procedure. So the next day, Mark goes back in for a polygraph test. They ask him, did your rental car in June 1989 play any role in the disappearance of Susan Smith? He said no. Did you have anything to do with the disappearance of Susan Smith? No. Have you ever been convicted of a crime? No. Have you ever violated the FBI's guidelines regarding illegal substances? No. Did you have sex with Susan Smith? No, I did not. And Ray just takes him out and he says, like, listen, the polygraph is spiking up on all of these questions that you have just answered. So, anything that you want to share. And he says he wants to talk to Kathy first. And Ray here is a seasoned detective. He sees the opportunity to get the information out of him here and now. If he pulls him into a room, he might be able to break him. Like, this guy is basically at its breaking point. But he also has nothing. He has no forensic evidence, no circumstantial evidence, no evidence at all tying Mark to this murder. And Mark knows the law. He knows this. So when Mark offers to go speak to Kathy first, Ray just has to agree. And Mark did go home to Kathy, and he actually confessed everything. He told her that he killed Susan Smith. He was not sure whether the child was his or not, but he confessed to killing, and he said, there was no excuse for what I did. Like, I need to go to prison. Like, look at me. I'm the shell of myself. I need to go to jail. But Kathy wanted to stick to him, and she was like, you have two small children. Like, if you go to jail... 
first of all, you might die in there. Like, you are an FBI agent. Like, the chances of you surviving in jail are already slim. But second of all, if you go to jail for 20 to 30 years, you're missing 20 to 30 years of your children's lives. So she convinced him to fight this, and she hired an attorney for him. And the lawyer looking at this case from the beginning said they have no evidence. Like, a year has passed, they have nobody, they have nothing tying you to the crime. We can get you acquitted if they can even bring this to trial. But Mark said, no, I want to confess, I want to serve some time in prison, nothing less than 10 years, I want to tell them where the body is, but also I'm not dumb. Like, I know if I was to serve in a regular prison, I would be dead second day in. So negotiate federal jail, I will tell them the body, and then negotiate the amount of years. And that is what happened. He negotiated that Mark should spend about 16 years in prison, but that he can be released after 10 years on good behavior in exchange or Mark giving up the location in that ravine. And here, the police was so surprised. They were like, there is no way that we wouldn't have found the body. But then they organized the search, and Susan Smith's decaying body was basically bones at this point, was found exactly where Mark said that they would find it. Susan was buried, surrounded by the people she knew her whole life, her family and her neighbors, about 40 of them, gathered in the viewing room of the Phelps funeral home, with a pastor leading the funeral proceedings. Mark went to serve his sentence of 10 years, and he said the most painful thing for him was the relationship, rather non-existent relationship, that he had with his son all the way up until he left prison. Because he said with his daughter, Danielle, he at least had about five years before he was in jail. But with his son, he had nothing. Like, the kid was basically a toddler. And that was the hardest part. And he would be reading and rereading Danielle's letters in prison. And he stayed in touch with Kathy all the way up until she died. This is the most fucked up part. Kathy died when she was 38, in 1998, only two years before Mark was released. And there are different causes of death online. It was a heart attack, I think, in the end, that was stated as the cause of death. But in different sources, I've seen that she might have turned to alcohol after Mark was in prison, and also her daughter was the one that found her dead. After Kathy's death, her parents took the children in up until Mark was released two years after that, and they sort of still stood by Mark. They said that he was a wonderful man and that this was just a crime of passion. After Mark was released on good behavior, after serving 10 years in the year 2000, he eventually remarried and moved to the South with his son and his daughter. Since Mark's case, FBI's policies have tightened surrounding informants, like there is always a supervisor auditing the budget and how much the informants can actually get. And in the year 1990, after Mark went to prison, Susan's family filed a wrongful death suit against him, and the judge awarded about half a mil in compensatory damages and about another half a mil in punitive damages against Putnam. Detective Ray got awarded as the trooper of the year, but he was so disgusted by how the department treated cases, especially Mark Putnam's one, and he retired shortly after. As for Susan's children, her son actually overdosed a few years after her mother's death, and died due to the combination of these pills that he took. Susan's daughter and Kenneth remained in that Kentucky area, living quiet lives, and Susan's daughter eventually got married and had a child. And that is the sad, sad story of the murder of Susan Smith. I find it such a strange, like, bizarre, mind-boggling case with so many things. Like, do you think that he would have killed had Susan not appeared in her life? Do you think had it had been somebody else? What do you think about him constantly gaslighting Susan? And what do you think about that affair? Like, was it happening during a longer period of time that Mark said that it was? 
because that kind of is where I'm leaning towards. Like, I don't think that he was ever 100% honest. Poor Katty and poor Susan, like, both of these women that died without having to die, without having to stress over what? Freaking Mark, who didn't really care about any of them. Third. And one reason why I find it so bizarre is that men usually in these cases that I tell you go on to kill their wives because they want to have their happily ever after with their mistresses and they just apparently have never heard of divorces. But Mark here wasn't really into his mistress, or at least that is what he tried to convince us all of. Like that he was definitely, most definitely not into Susan. And you kind of got to take it with a grain of salt. That is one main problem I had with this book. It's like, yes, those are the interviews that we have with Mark, but is it all legit? It's all coming out of a mouth of a murderer. Like, do we really trust this guy completely? And then we have the freaking thing of, like, was she actually pregnant? Like, did this doctor issue those papers, those results, because she actually was pregnant? Was that fabricated? Like, even with the autopsy, yeah, that's one thing that I didn't say, like, they performed autopsy on her, and again, this author just doesn't mention that. They were like, oh yeah, they managed to match that this was Susan because of her dental records. I'm like, (laughs) Joey... Joey, we are not on the freaking same page. All that the public wants to know is was she actually freaking pregnant? Because then, if she wasn't, this is even more pointless than it is right now. Like, her death, like, should have never, ever happened. And the final hill that I should die on is who the fuck married this dude after prison? Served 10 years in prison. You know he served it because he, what, slapped and killed his lover. Like, there's a book written on it. There's a movie about suspicion with freaking Mother of Dragons out there. I haven't watched it. Let me know if you have watched it called Above Suspicion. So, hey, Emilia Clarke is in it. People have probably watched it because Emilia Clarke is in it. I'm not saying don't give them a chance after they leave prison, but I don't know. I don't know if I would be able to just sleep peacefully at night knowing that somebody has killed a woman that they were involved with, and now suddenly I'm the woman that they are involved with. But that is all of the information that I have for you today. If you like this kind of content, make sure you give this video thumbs up, big thumbs up, and that you subscribe to the channel, because there's more coming, always, every week. There's more coming, and make sure you have those notifications on. I usually post on Wednesdays and Fridays, depending on, you know, how many videos I have prepped for the week. And as you can see, we have an introduction or a screen in the background. Let me know your opinions on that. Like, I can easily move it off the desk. I just find that the low five team kind of puts me in the calm mode. Like, that's the whole point of this whole background that I have going on. This is like a safe space. I'm talking about gruesome things, but this is a safe space. And then the images of the people that I'm talking about kind of give me, like, the perception that, you know, I have the audience. Like, I have an audience, it's as if it was, like, a live show. I might be going insane. It might be happening. I might be losing my mind. So, let me know if you like it, if you don't, in the comments. And let me know what you think about this case. And I shall be seeing you guys next week. (laughs) Bye. Oh, bye. Oh, bye. Up, Susan. <sighs> Just like that presentation. I had a PowerPoint going on. Okay, exit the video. Exit. So this is gonna get interesting. Do you hear the rain? This mic doesn't block everything out. Of course, they hear the fucking downpour that is going on behind. <sighs> if I could move the curtains, I could actually see. Everything's smoothing, everything, oh my god, they just calm themselves down. <laughs> Too intense. He's lost a ton of weight and has been getting sick more and more often. Something is going on. <laughs> and I find it such a mind boggling case because usually, you know, men go to kill their wives in order to end up with their mistresses instead of getting a divorce because men are fucking retards. These old tactics with, like, bad cup, good cup, like, on each side, like, with the intensity. I can deal with the intensity. I cannot deal with silence. This is how you get them. You just go, uh-huh. Mm-hmm. The awkwardness, people start talking. 
people are talking, giving me information. Patrick Swayze movie. I've seen this movie. I don't really know what the movie is about. <laughs> like, but you see, this uh, short memory. Like, he asked him what was the name of the movie, and this guy was like Roadhouse or Rock House. Like, mate, <laughs> what was the movie about? I don't really know. Like, why did you volunteer this information in the first place, sir?